Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. All right, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining me uh, today on The Bend. A really special treat for you. Um, I'm going to welcome Frank King. I met Frank a couple of years ago when he gave a talk to the Vet Partners Group. He is um, a mental health expert talking about suicide prevention, but in a little different way than most people do because he's also a comedian. He is a six-time TEDx talker. He is a TEDx speaker and marketing coach. And this is very cool, a former writer for The Tonight Show for 20 years. I'm going to ask you about, was it Johnny Carson or was it Jay Leno, Frank, or a little bit of both, maybe? Actually, I started with Jay when Jay was the permanent guest host after um, Gary Shandling said, no, I'm going to do The Gary Shandling Show or Larry Sanders Show, I guess. Okay. And then Joan Rivers stepped on it by having her own little talk show and Johnny got mad. So Jay was, he got it by default almost. He was in the running. And Johnny would pull up on a Friday night and go, I'm taking next week off, which meant Jay had four nights to cover, four monologues, 18 jokes per night. So he started hiring road comics because I was on the road at the time, my lovely wife and I, to write jokes because he needed them, he needed them fast. So we'd crank out, I'd crank out a dozen, two dozen jokes a day. And he would go down to the Hermosa Beach Comedy Magic Club with a stack of index cards because his staff would put the jokes on the index cards. And Leno would just go through them one right after another. And if it hit, he put it in his pocket. If it didn't, he'd throw it in, you know, on the floor. Oh, my gosh. And, and then when he took, took over the show, he let most of those people go who were just contractors. Mm-hmm. But I got to stay on with some other guys. And so we wrote it all the way till he left for CNBC. That is really cool. I see, you know, the, the behind-the-scenes stuff of this um, is very fascinating to me because I think that most people would think, oh, Jay Leno got up, he wrote all his own jokes and he just you know, came up with a monologue. But there's a team of people behind them oh, yeah. doing all that work and coming up with all those jokes. So uh, that's pretty cool. But now you um, talk about this, that you have fought a lifetime battle with depression, thoughts of suicide, turning that dark journey of your soul into TEDx talks and sharing your insights on suicide and and post-prevention with corporations, association, and college audiences, because you are a speaker and um, a keynote speaker for these. Mm -hmm. Um, You use your life lessons from all of the above, as well as lessons learned from crisscrossing the country in the late 80s and early 90s, doing 2,629 nights in a row on the comedy club circuit. That just makes me tired to think about that, Frank. Seven years. Um, I said to my wife with my girlfriend then, my second wife, um, I'm going on the road to stand up. You want to come along for the ride? Figured she'd go, oh, hell no. <laughs> and she goes, yeah. Why not? So we gave up our apartment, quit our jobs, put everything in storage we couldn't fit into my tiny little Dodge Colt. And we just hit the road. And we didn't intend to go on the road for seven years and change. It just, it was a comedy club boom. There were comedy clubs everywhere. So I worked very hard to stay booked year round. Yeah. And we did for, uh, and then um, uh, around Easter of 93, got a job offer in Raleigh, North Carolina, my old hometown, to work on the number one morning show, rock and roll morning show in Raleigh. And so I took the job and came off the road. And then when I got fired, as you will in radio, Mm-hmm. Uh, two kinds of people. People who've been fired. People are going to be fired. <laughs> uh, the comedy club thing was, you know, the boom it was busting, and so I went into corporate comedy, which is just clean comedy at, at conferences. Mm-hmm. 
And then the recession hit in 07. And that end, I mean, 80% of my business disappeared overnight. That's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like because we had to file chapter seven bankruptcy. And then when the meeting planners, when the speaking began to come back after the recession, they said, look, Frank, we love you. Um, we just can't pay that kind of money simply to be funny. You got to teach us something. What? Yeah. So I looked at my family history, more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd. <laughs> um, I know, uh, you know, Southerners and expressions. Um, and my own personal history. And I thought, you know, if I, if I could learn some suicide prevention techniques, I could keynote on suicide prevention. And I had no, and, and I had to rebrand. So that's why I did my first TED talk to let people know I could talk about something serious and we're talking deadly serious. And I just got off a podcast and she said to me, uh, so when did you, um, when, did, when did you let everybody know you were depressed and suicidal? I said, I was 56 years old and I was on the TEDx stage. I came out on the TEDx. I, I had to say to my wife, which is about to play it on YouTube for the first time, look, don't hit play. I got to tell you about half a dozen things about me you don't know, and I don't want you to learn. I'm just staring at the screen. So I, I kept it to myself. People with mental illness oftentimes are great actors, and they just paste on a smile and, you know, pretend nothing is wrong. And I, that was me. Yeah. So. Well, obviously, if you are depressed and can still write comedy, that's that's really a beard, right? At the comedy. Would, yeah, it, 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 you know, people thought of me as happy go lucky and a comedian. Um, the irony is, I believe, and I did a whole TEDx talk on this, that my comedic ability, imagination, and creativity is simply the flip side of my depression and thoughts of suicide. It's the same brain. Mm -hmm. I can teach you to write stand up, perform stand up. I cannot teach you to process it, you know, the incoming information the way I do. So that's, I just think it's, yeah, it's, it's um, that was the TED talk. It's called Mental with Benefits because I kept meeting people who were mentally ill, but high functioning. And they all, in addition to the mental disability, they all had some sort of extraordinary ability, singer, writer, you know, comedian, actor, just were they, something. Were they all creatives, Frank? Is that, do you think that is a, a creative part of your brain that um, maybe is? Yes, um, creative in, in not necessarily in show business creative, but entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. In Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, he talks about dyslexia and the numbers show it's not completely scientific and proved, but he said half the people who have dyslexia learn to adjust, do workarounds, compensate, and often become very successful and often entrepreneurs. And the other 50% often up in jail. So, oh, you're dyslexic. I am dyslexic. Yeah. I, the, when digital watches came out, I was so happy. I and guess so. For years, telling time I would have to look at the face of a clock and then almost reverse it in my head. And my D's and B's are always backwards. If I'm in a hurry to write, I have to, you know, back up, but yeah, I'm, I'm just a, li a little dyslexic. <laughs> well, and dyslexics have a better peripheral vision generally than the average human. And also oftentimes dyslexics have the uncanny ability to find, pick out the anomaly in anything. The joke I wrote was never play where's Waldo with a dyslexic for money, because you're gonna lose. <laughs> it's true, it's true. My uh, staff used to hate the fact that sometimes the attention to detail led them on chases of what that weird smell was. It, somewhere in that animal hospital, there was a funky smell and and they were like, no, you're crazy. I'm like, it's there, <laughs> I'm telling you. And I would track it down like a bloodhound. Um, now I have to ask you because you, you grew up in my neck of the woods are you a, still a UNC Chapel Hill fan? Well, not if anybody in Eugene asks. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm a Duck fan, if anybody here asks, yeah. for business reasons. Or you can be a um, Beavers fan in Corvallis, you know, uh, Oregon State. But that's that's it. You got to pick one of those or don't do business in town. <laughs> yeah, but I'm still a UNC fan. I graduated in 79 okay. from UNC. My mom insisted I go to college. I, I told my first joke in the fourth grade. The students laughed, the teacher was hysterical, and I thought, I'm going to be a comedian. In 12th grade, they had a talent show at Broughton Senior High School in Raleigh, North Carolina, and nobody had ever done stand-up before. Yeah. So I did, and I won. And I told my mama, I'm going to be a comedian. She goes, son, you're going to college first. I don't care what you do when you get done. You can be a goat herder for all I care, but you're going to be a goat herder with a college degree. 
So. And, and I did I did stop you a little bit and found out that you have a BA and a BS in industrial relations and political science. Science. And thinking about comedy and political science, I think that's probably a good fit for you. <laughs> There's a lot of funny material. Oh God. In politics. I, and I wasn't terribly political then. I'm a political junkie now. If I could, I would have to go back in time because I could write some very funny, you know, papers. I mean, with, and make a point. Uh, yeah, yeah. So not I have political opinions, but uh, yeah. So it's and and no, I'm not sorry. I went to school. There are worse things in a good liberal arts education. True, absolutely true. And Chapel Hill is a fun town. So yes, oh yes. Sure, you had a good time uh, walking those hills because there's some hills. Oh there. man, uh, I was in Airing House, which is a dorm on campus, and it's at the essentially the bottom of a hill that leads up to campus. And there are mornings when I would stare up that hill <laughs> and go, "No, nah, I'm going back to bed." It was just too much. It's too, too much. Now, you're also the uh, spokesperson for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. You are an instructor for Stand Up for Mental Health and a volunteer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Yep. And we were just talking a little bit before uh, we got on camera here about COVID and the uptick in mental challenges because of the pandemic and all the restrictions and the stress and the fear that that has brought out into people who didn't suffer from mental health problems no. prior to, but I'm imagining that you're seeing a lot, a lot more calls um, on those lines, you know, as you go through your, your time with them, those volunteers. Well, and I've been doing a lot of podcasts and I even created a keynote called social distancing and staying sane. Don't worry so much about your mentally ill friends. Because if you're mentally ill and you're high functioning, chances are you've got systems in place. Because I wake up in an uncertain world every day, whether there's a pandemic or not. And some mornings I just don't want to get out of bed. And so what I've been doing is I realized early on that those skills are transferable. They're very simple, mm -hmm. straightforward. The through, through line for all of them is um, you have um, control. My, my um, self-care plan that I teach is, has five elements. One is a diet. I'm on the keto diet and I intermittent fast. Right now I'm at hour 47 of a two-day fast. Um, exercise, I've got behind me is an old Nordic track. You remember the Nordic track? You wouldn't recognize it because there's no clothes hanging on it. But <laughs> I know. Um, and then, you know, like a, an ab wheel and some stretchy bands. And off and on, the, the gym is actually open and you can go. So diet, exercise, good night's sleep is restorative. And it's important to get a good night's sleep, uh, you know, reset. Uh, meditation, I do a meditation twice a day. It's a 29-minute guided meditation, takes you down, then brings you back up. You will awake refreshed. And then medication. I finally, at age 60, got some medication for depression. And um, it doesn't make me giddy, but it does take the edge off. So diet, exercise, good night's sleep, meditation, and if indicated, medication if and if you get medication it's not working because uh, only one third of the people who get a mental medication like it the other middle third it's okay and the last third ugh, gotta get off there's a dna cheek swab test now they take your dna and they try to match it to the antidepressant or anti-anxiety bed that works best with your metabolism not perfect but at least it dials it in mm -hmm. so it's you know because the doctor only really knows what the drug salesman told him exactly yeah so, yeah, so that's that. That is my self care plan. I've been teaching that to, because what worries me is all these people who've never been mentally ill, never been depressed, and they're now what's called situationally depressed because of the of the pandemic and of the uncertainty and the anxiety and the worry and the anger that the guy in front of you in line at the grocery store apparently can't figure out the mask technology to pull it over his nose. Right, exactly. I was at the hardware store this morning. There's a guy in front of me line, sure enough, mask is down here. And he's obviously a contractor. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if you cannot operate that mask, should you be working with power tools? Uh, so, yeah, so, but all that, all that wears on people. And if you've never been depressed, how would you know why you can't get out of bed in the morning? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've never been there, you don't, how would you recognize the symptoms? So that's, that's why I've been doing the keynotes and the podcasts um, on talking about how people with mental illness who are high functioning survive you know day in day out and it it's fortunately those skills are transferable the other thing is a uh, gamification gamification 
I can't get out of bed, I make a game of it. I make a to-do list, six things. I get out of bed, I start the to-do list. When I scratch off number six, I don't care if it's three in the afternoon, broad daylight, I go back to bed, pull the covers over my head and watch the second season of Mandalorian on Disney Plus. Because I win. <laughs> That's gamification because it gets you moving forward. Right, yeah. But there's Beyond well, just the six things you're going to do, there's there's a win. There's a yeah. goal there. You can go back to bed and watch Ozark. Um, and then routine. You the win, right? You're, that's your reward. It's the... That's my reward. I get to go back to bed. Mm -hmm. And then routine. They ask a guy who's been in a space station for a year, pretty much by himself, unless they're bringing up groceries. How do you survive that kind of social isolation? He goes, uh, it's a routine. I go to bed same time, get up same time, eat same time, exercise same time. I have a routine. And the thread, the through line for all those things, routine, gamification, and my self-care plan is those are all things I can control in a very uncontrolled environment. Right. Well, you know, I talk a lot about communication and one of the, I think the challenges right now, it, because people have been isolated for a long time, we're kind of losing a little bit of our social skills. We are, we're good about how to be in, in with humans. And the other thing is that our tribe of humans also helps keep us in line. So we, if we start to get off the rails a little bit, People will go, dude, you know, that's kind of weird. You need to straighten back up again. That doesn't make any sense. And we go, oh, I guess it is a little nuts. So they quit doing it. But we don't have anybody doing that for us right now uh, or like a lot. And so we kind of are getting so far left, so far right, really off the rails in our thinking, not to mention that we're spending way too much time looking at social media and having algorithms feed us nonsense that um, we're going to struggle. But I do want to know, like you, you already said, like when you were a kid, you wanted to be a comedian and then your mom, you know, made you go to school, but still, how did you get to, you know, from USC Chapel Hill and Poli Sci to writing on the Tonight Show? I mean, that seems to be, there's got to be some curves in that path. Well, and when I was in college and Johnny Carson was still on, we would in this, all gather around the television in the suite at the dorm and watch Johnny. And I, I would sit there and wonder if anybody else in the room was thinking, I'd like to be on that show. I'm thinking I may be the only one. So after I got um, through college, my high school and college sweetheart, although she went to another college across the country, we got we, we made it work for four years at, at a distance and got married. Uh, mistake, by the way, because she's a wonderful woman. We just had nothing in common. But you know what they say, opposites attract. She was pregnant, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the insurance company I went to work for, her father worked for. He helped me get the job. And they transferred me to San Diego. A uh, twist of fate. Because there's a comedy store there, still is. They branch of the world famous one up on Sunset in LA. And they had an open mic night. They actually had two or three of them my nights. It was the beginning of the comedy boom. And um, my fourth TEDx talk is called Suicide, the Secret of My Success, Dead Man Talking. What happened was, for the first time in my life, uh, I realized I was depressed and suicidal. And it, it was because I was married and miserable, uh, although she's a wonderful woman. I was selling insurance, great business, but I was miserable, but it really wasn't for me. And I wasn't going to the comedy store to do open mic night, which is where I thought I belonged. So I realized that if I didn't change something, I was going to kill myself. And my second thought was, well, wait a minute. I could divorce my wife, quit my job, try comedy. If it works, great. If it doesn't, heck, I can still kill myself. So that's how suicide. And I thought I was the only one who ever thought that way. Mm -hmm. And I've met a number of entrepreneurs and entertainers who had the very same, living a life they knew wasn't where they belonged, had a dream, weren't pursuing it, realized if I, if I stay put, I'm done. So why not roll the dice? You know, put it all on one roll of the dice and see what happens. And that's what I did. And that's how I got back to the And when I was on stage that first five minutes, inside my head about halfway through, I heard a little voice, you're home. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And my second thought was, I'm gonna make a living doing this. I have no idea how that works, but. <laughs> Figure it out as you go, you know. Yeah. I love that because so many times I feel like, um, and talking especially to a lot of people in veterinary medicine, they feel like they're stuck. You know, they went to school, they have a lot of student loan debt, they have this degree. And I'm like, okay, now I'm stuck being this thing because I've, I've gone to school and now I have to be this. Yeah. But you don't have to be that. You can change the rules anytime you want to. You just have to have 
kind of the bravery to do it and realize what have you got to lose? Because you'll only lose misery, right? You know, if you're not happy and I've told people a lot, you know, life is short. You better do what you like because you don't get a do over here. Just do something that makes you happy and do it. And, um, but there's a lot of people who are stuck. So I, I like the fact that you just said, you know, in my head, what have I got to lose? I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. I'm yeah. For it. Yeah. I stay put, I die. I, you know, I, I go for it. I, I, I may still die, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, well, we all die in the end, right? So, yeah. Well, <laughs> and I opened the talk by saying, um, what audacious thing would you attempt if you knew for a fact you had nothing to lose? What goal would you pursue if you knew by not pursuing it, you would literally die? Mm -hmm. That's where I was in January of 84 mm -hmm. and told the story that I just told you. I just, you know, it, it, it propelled me into comedy, which is where I thought I belonged. And it turns out I did. Thank God. Well, yeah. Seven um, years on the road getting booked. Obviously people liked you and like what you did and you were successful at that because um, that's a long time. You know, it was that. It was a great time though. My wife, my, it was my girlfriend when we left town. We got married uh, in the backyard at a family reunion in Raleigh because a friend of mine owned the comedy club there had booked me over 4th of July weekend because that's when we always had our family reunion. So he booked me so I could be there and make money. So we got married in the backyard over barbecue and coleslaw and hush puppies. And the, that night I did three shows at the comedy club. Wow. So, it was, you know, but but we, um, my wife and I, uh, back then they used to put us up in three bedroom condos. They call them comedy condos. So instead of having hotel rooms, they just get a condo and have it cleaned every week. And so I, we not only worked with Seinfeld and Dennis Miller and Ron White and Foxworthy and Bill Engvall and Rosie and Ellen and you know all those people, Adam, Adam Sandler, Kevin James. We lived with them for a week at a time. So it was it was an amazing you know, time to be in comedy and to work with people that that talented and interesting and, you know. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. I can't imagine ever sleeping if you had a group of people that were all that funny in one place. Oh God. Just constantly riffing off each other. Ron White <laughs> is funny on stage, but off stage, even funnier. We were sitting around after, I think we watched, we watched the Tonight Show and then Letterman, Letterman, and he starts telling stories. And the first one went like this. All right. I'm in Amarillo, Texas. I'm with a hooker and a midget. Okay. Any story that's got a hooker and a midget in it, I don't care if my bladder explodes. I'm not leaving the room until I find out how this comes out. That's Ron. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. He, you know, just thinking about him makes my belly hurt because I've never watched anything he's done that I just haven't laughed until I heard. Um, he is... Uh, personal, he's been married like four times and three of them to cocktail waitresses. He goes, yeah, you know, I married so many cocktail waitresses. Now for a woman to get me excited, she has to put on a shirt, skirt, and walk around the house cleaning ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh Lord. Oh my gosh. So I'm just curious, Is was it pretty seamless like when you started did you just start started getting bookings or getting bookings in more and more popular places and bigger places and bigger events and well I, I booked 10 weeks then all through one booker and then the first week I worked actually the first week I worked the 10th week disappeared the club closed but the first week I worked I worked with a guy named Bill King no relation who had a club in Washington DC and so I got my you know the at the end of that nine weeks, I had another booking. And it just kind of, and when I would go through a town, let's say Lubbock, Texas, uh, Jody's Comedy, whatever it was, I would go on and say, can I do a, you know, like an audition, a guest spot? So that's, how, as, as we traveled around, I would do these guest spots in these clubs in hopes of getting booked. And it was, it was, the timing was such that there was a club just about, I mean, not a, not, a, not like a Charlie Goodnights in Raleigh club, but a lot of one-nighters, horrible beer bar, pool hall, honky tonk, drunk idiots screaming, tell us some jokes we can dance to. <laughs> okay, here comes a slow one, you can slow dance. That was the the hard one-nighters, the glue that held it all together. Because uh -huh. we didn't have a home. Right. And we we dropped in on relatives all over the country because we didn't have a home. Oh my Hi, God. we're coming. Yeah. That, see, that's crazy. I thought, oh, well, he probably got an RV and was just traveling around in this RV, but you were in a car just... Cool. Yeah, we thought about getting an RV many times. We should have. We should have gotten a, like a cab, a big truck with a camp, you know, the camper on the back. Uh -huh. But we just never, we never quite got there. Yeah. 
Um, so just obviously there's got to be some bumps in the road, some failures, some mistakes. Oh, yeah. What were some of the things you learned from just goofs? Well, someone asked about the pandemic. How was I surviving? I said, look, here's the deal. I've got two mental illnesses, uh, major depressive disorder and chronic suicidal ideation. Um, I've had two aortic valve replacements, a double bypass, a heart attack, and three stents, and I lost to a duck puppet on Star Search. This is not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, oh yeah. I was telling somebody, one of my clients for TEDx coaching, she got turned down by one or two, you know, you send applications in to do the TEDx. She got turned down by one or two TEDx, and she's just beside herself, distraught. And I said, you know, I, I'd like to relate, but as a comedian, um, you know, that kind of rejection is a way of life. Yeah. I said, I was turned down by the Tonight Show, for which I was writing, by the way. Tonight Show, Letterman and Conan, 12 times each. 12 times. Wow. Wow. Last Comic Standing, four times. America's Got Talent, twice. I mean, it's just the what, you know, and, and the last TED Talk I did, I think I applied to 15 events before the 16th went yes it i knew with the talk not everybody was going to like it but i'd find somebody who would love it it's called mental health and the orgasm treat your depression single-handedly <laughs> i know and the and the people that liked it i didn't even have to audition uh -huh. normally you have to audition and then you get it they go no 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 you're coming to colorado yeah. oh in colorado we're in Denver. Durango. yeah durango uh Durango. I'll be there next week, by the way, in Grand Junction. A uh, uh, big na it's NAMI, National Alliance Mental Illness Fundraiser, comedy fundraiser. I'd be bringing out the hall and we're going to do comedy. So, how did you get from, uh, well, you, you told me just a little bit about, uh, you know, you were doing stand up and then how did you get to the Tonight Show from stand up? Was that just a fluke or was that just well it was timing again because jay had become the permanent guest host because mm -hmm. um shandling gary shandling said no i'm going to do the larry sanders show and joan rivers had stepped on it by doing her own talk show and made johnny mad so the only person left last man standing was leno so leno took the job as permanent guest host and johnny would come up on a friday night and go i'm taking next week off like you know uh, thanks for the notice yeah so Jay was responsible because that Monday nights used to be best of Carson, a rerun. So that means there are four nights, four monologues, 18 jokes per monologue. Leno, Leno had to essentially come up with over the weekend. Mm -hmm. So we started hiring road comics, um, you know, making them subcontractors. You fill out the paperwork, they give you a fax number, and I would fax in a dozen, two dozen jokes a day in preparation so Jay could prepare for the Tonight Show. And then when he got the gig for real, he let most of the subcontracting writers go, but he kept some of us on. Mm -hmm. And we, when I had my first valve job and I got out, of, got out of ICU and picked up my messages, somebody had told Lynn I was having heart surgery. So the first message on my machine, hey, it's Jay Lynn, heard you had heart surgery. It's a good thing you didn't have it done in LA. They take it out and leave it out. So, <laughs> and then, we rode myself and the other other riders. We stayed with him until he left for CNBC when he left the Tonight Show. So, yeah. just another you know another example of life's all about timing. It, you know that is that is so true. I I can remember going to my first big conference and seeing somebody speak at this big veterinary conference and just kind of randomly thinking, you know, one day I think I might like to do that. And then in, you know, ten years later, I'm speaking at a lot of veterinary conferences and traveling every couple of weeks in front of a group and, and talking to somebody. And of course, you know, that's most people's greatest fear is standing in front of an audience and speaking to people. And I'm like, you know what? Not me, man. I love it. I'm my, my extroverted personality is all about it. Oh so, yeah. yeah. You kind of feed off of the energy of the audience. And, I'm, uh, I'm more comfortable with that than I'm in real life. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I, one summer, I had two nights opening for Randy Travis in a, in a 5,000 seat amphitheater. And, you know, I mean, he's got, Randy's got a band and lyrics and music. And I got a microphone, uh, 5,000 people and never even broke sweat. And when I turned 63, I decided I wanted to fulfill a bucket list item, which was to be in a bodybuilding contest. 
I waited until I was in my 60s because you're in the master's class and, and, and most of the guys have quit before then. And so 5,000 people all by myself with the microphone on stage, didn't break a sweat, wearing basically underwear in front of 300 people, flexing my muscles. I was terrified. <laughs> be so oh, yeah it's nightmarish yes you know because every now and then I have a dream i'm outside walking around somewhere in my underwear i'm like wow i have my underwear it's <laughs> that bodybuilding but, contest and there i was yeah. Um, yeah so so frank did you do you feel like networking uh contributed to your ability to you know be successful in your career get you where you needed to go oh honey um the i did my mom was a an amazing networker. I didn't know that's what it was called. I just learned it at her knee. People call her all times day or night. Dixie, her name was Dixie. Dixie, can you help me? She loved pulling strings. She, we even developed a family. When I was a kid, I at four years old, I said to my mom, can I be a police officer? She goes, honey, you can be anything you put your mind to. Or you can do anything you put your mind to. So I thought about that at age four or five. And I said, could I grow hair on my chest? She goes, yeah, I think, you know, given time. And then I flipped it on her. Could you? <laughs> well, I, I suppose if I tried real hard. So anytime she would do something where somebody asked her to do something, and it, was, it wasn't impossible, it was highly improbable. She'd come through the back door at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the afternoon after work and go, hey, guys, I grew hair on my chest today. <laughs> that was our way of saying we had pulled something off. Yeah. And so I, when I... I mean, I was amazed at Barnes and Noble when I saw my first book on how to network. I thought everybody doesn't do this. Everybody doesn't give value first without expectation of return. What's wrong with you people? Exactly. Yeah, I, I, it's just somebody asked me this morning on a Facebook post, you know, what's your most valuable quality or something? And I put empathy. And I said, because oftentimes people with uh, depression are more empathetic, feel love is pain. I said, and Empathy is at the heart of networking because when you meet somebody, it's not about what they can do for you, it's what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. That's to me the heart of networking. And actually the best thing I've ever done in my life, and if I never do anything else ever again, nice for anybody, uh, I helped a friend of mine, a fellow student at a martial arts class in Whidbey, on Whidbey Island, Washington, in um, the before 2000, 2007, eight, something like that. Anyway, I went to the martial arts class and her name is Elise and she was crying. And I said, Elise, what's wrong? She goes, well, we're trying to adopt a three-year-old from Nepal and, and my husband's on his last visa and we won't be able to afford to send him back. And, and it looks like it's not gonna happen. I said, well, why is it not gonna happen? Well, you know, the birth father and mother signed off and the Nepalese government signed off. Well, who's standing in the way? She said, Homeland Security. I said, I've never had a three-year-old, but..." I can't believe he's that big a terrorist at that age. And the problem was she was well-connected in the state of Washington with all the Democrats, senators, governor, but it was right smack in the middle of the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change international policy, you need a Republican. So I said to her out loud, I'll see what I can do. And I'm, it had to be my mother speaking through me because I, I, I said to myself, did I just say that out loud? I mean, I'm on an island in a Puget Sound. I'm going to, you know, influence international politics half world away. But I believe if you give voice to something like that, it takes on a power of its own. I'm driving home thinking, okay, how can I network? Because my wife will tell you, I collect people and I connect people. How can I network my way to get this done? I thought, oh, a kid I went to junior high school with, who was a year ahead of me, became mayor of Raleigh when I was back there working on the radio. We got reacquainted and hung out at the YMCA. And he'd worked for, um, as repellent as he is, or was, Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms. Um, yeah. Yep. The, but he, he was connected mm -hmm. to Republicans in Washington. So I called Tom and I gave him the story. And he said famously, I'll see what I can do. So he called Liddy Dole, who was a senator at the time. And so I called Tom on Monday. On Wednesday, Tom called me back. I said, um, what did Liddy have to say? What did she do? He said, Frank, if you forgive the vulgarity, she told me, and I quote, I tore Homeland Security a new. <laughs> so they sent a, a diplomatic pouch to Nepal with instructions 
let the kid go. Mm -hmm. But I knew none of those. So Monday morning, I'm back in class, no Elise. Tuesday morning, no Elise. I think, oh, man, it didn't work. It didn't work. I go to the grocery store after class. I'm pushing my little buggy around. I come around the corner, and there stands Elise, holding the hand of a darling little three-year-old. And now she's crying. And I'm crying. And he looked up at me with his big brown eyes. His name's Avi. He looked up at me and he goes, Avi, go pee pee. <laughs> and I said, yes. And uh, on American soil, uh -huh. I do believe. Yeah. yeah. So if I never do anything else, it, but it was something I learned from my mother. It was, it's all about, you do it because you can do it. Right. Yeah. Not because there's anything in it. No, there was nothing in it for Tom Fetz or my friend. There was nothing in it for Liddy Dole. There was nothing really in it for me. But, you know, it, that comedy makes me happy. Um, you know, doing speaking on suicide prevention makes me happy. But pulling something like that off makes my heart sing. I mean, how many times in your life can you have that kind of impact on three people? And who knows how many more? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm, a, I just, and I, I did a 15 minute version of that talk at a chamber of commerce, maybe. And somebody came up and they go, how do you make people laugh and cry and get a standing ovation in 15 minutes? <laughs> well, you move them emotionally. Yeah. Good you speak from the heart, not from the head. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love matchmaking. Um, I went oh. to, to uh, lunch one day with one of my friends and, she, and I spoke to a bunch of people in the restaurant and she sat down and she said, it, oh, did we never go any place that you don't know somebody? And I went, well, <laughs> I do <laughs> really know a lot of people. And I love, like you say, collecting people and knowing about the people. I always have found people fascinating. Oh, yeah. And, and interesting. And, and if they if I can do something, if I can make a connection for somebody, then you're right. It's, it's fun for me. It's how I, you know, and you don't do it to get anything in return. You do it just because you like it, you know, just because you can. And, um, and then you step back and you say, wow, that worked out so well. I'm so excited that that worked out for you and put those connections together. It's really yeah. And you know, sometimes people, um, I helped a comedian friend, she was she was doing comedy clubs and that's rough on women because it's mostly guys and it's you know it's it's condos in dangerous neighborhoods and, you know, anyway um i helped her get into corporate comedy on the corporate side where the money's a lot better and of course the accommodations are better mm -hmm. and then years later uh last recession uh, i was gonna have to get a real job because comedy and speaking dropped off then she goes you are not she goes i've, I've got a cruise agent and they've got a showcase next Friday. And I know for a fact somebody just dropped out. So if you fly to yourself to Atlanta and do the showcase, maybe get some cruise work. And I worked for Holland America for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it saved our bacon after the bankruptcy. That was pretty much the only money we had coming in working those boats after bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, so. you know, and, and like I said, people, people will do it for you. It just and it's just you know I, I I'm a believer in random acts of kindness and um, I think that that's that's just one of those things that you can and should do and you know, people are right now they're looking at the news and they look at the news too much and they look at all the social media stuff and they go oh people are horrible I went no no people no. are wonderful. people are really no. wonderful there are a few horrible people yeah and they get all the press people are really <laughs> wonderful and. Yeah. If you think about that, um, that'll keep you going, you know, that, that good in the world that, you know, not everybody's a hundred percent wonderful. No, everybody lives in their own kind of little world, but most people have good intentions. And a lot of times when I'm training staff and there's drama, I went, look, start, assume positive intent, just start there. Yeah. People don't mean to come out and do things that hurt you or, or intentionally hurt you. They're just coming from their own plays. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a great deal of your main focus, which is the suicide prevention and, and your TED Talks and how you became a keynote speaker and moved out of comedy into doing all this volunteer work because, you know, you do a, you do a lot of powerful stuff. And I, I remember... Uh, and I don't know if you remember, but I did come up and talk to you after you gave a, a talk for the Vet Partners Group because my father committed suicide when I was 16. And a, it had been about a year since my best friend, um, my, my husband's very, very best friend, had committed suicide on Thanksgiving Day. And 
You talked to me a little bit about, you know, how people who are contemplating suicide think differently. And you talked about the suicide ideation, which really struck me. And mm -hmm. because my husband was having a really hard time losing his friend and there was, there was anger, you know, that they were gone. And, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, that's a natural thing, but would you be mad at him if he had a heart attack and died? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I um, really would like to know about, you know, the path that got you into the work that you do now and um, trying to help people with mental health. Well, and it, it, it actually is kind of a, uh, a cousin of networking. When I started comedy in 85 at Christmas, day after Christmas, all that time, I always wanted to make a living and a difference. I could just never figure out how to make a difference beyond making people laugh for 45 minutes. I joined the NSA, National Speaker Association. Everybody was making a difference except for me. I even took a militant stance. My tagline was, make a living, not a difference. Because everybody was, you know, making a difference. But it was just jealousy, just professional jealousy. I was like, I can't make a difference. So was forced into doing that after the last recession when the media planner said, we can't pay that kind of money anymore. Just to be funny. Got to teach you something. And you know, looked at my history, my family history, learned some, learned some, some uh, suicide prevention, took some training, and then did my first TED talk. I had to rebrand from a funny guy to a guy who was simply funny. And and, and <laughs> that, that talk on you know coming out coming out on stage at age fifty six as depressed and suicidal and telling my story, which is gruesome, um, my family history story, my. That tell you, my grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. Wow. Screaming for days. Um, and and more nuts in my family than a squirrel turd. Um, so that's that was where I realized I could make a difference. And then what I discovered preparing for the first TEDx was, even though one person in the United States dies every nine minutes of suicide, that's like that's like that's 146 people a day. It's like a 747, a 737 going into the ground like a lawn dart every day, losing everybody. Mm -hmm. But nobody talks about it unless you bring it up. And then, dear God, everybody's got a story. Huh? I mean, it's, it's, I was on a ship, a Holland Wreck ship, and, and I was um, looking for a place to sit down for breakfast, and it was pretty busy, and I couldn't, and I saw a table for two, a woman sitting there, empty chair. I point, she nods, I sit. She looks up, she goes, Hey, are you the comedian? I said, hey, did you enjoy the comedy show? She goes, I did. Then I'm the comedian. <laughs> she starts laughing. What would, what would you say if I told you I hated it? Well, they say I look a lot like him. <laughs> yeah, she asked me what I did besides comedy. I said, I'm a public speaker. And if you don't mind me bragging, I just nailed down my very first TEDx talk. She goes, I love the TED Talks. What's the topic? Now, I've had this conversation many times. So I thought I knew what was coming. So I said to her, depression and suicide. And I started to count down on my head. Three, two, one. She goes, you know, Frank, I tried to kill myself twice. We've just met. I mean, she saw me on stage. We have just personally met. First time in college, kind of half-hearted, not a big deal. Second time, far more serious. I had graduated from college. I had graduated from medical school. I had the knowledge, had the equipment, had the IV started in my ankle. Suicide cocktail in one hand, syringe in the other, getting ready to load it up. Phone ring. She goes, did I answer it? And I figured I better, somebody might worry, come over, interrupt. Picked it up, 13-year-old son. I don't know if he heard something in, his, in my voice or had a premonition, but he said simply, mom, don't do anything. So I didn't. I didn't give up on the idea of suicide, but I didn't want to do it that day because I knew he'd always feel guilty when there's something he could say or do to prevent my suicide. And there are things you can say, there are things you can do. I said, how old is he now? She goes, he's 21. I said, does he know his phone call saved your life? And this became my tagline. Uh, she goes, no, how do you start that conversation? And I thought you'd do a TED Talk. And so when I, when I go to speak, oftentimes, whoever hired me says to me, Frank, we do, you know, we just brought you in here to start the conversation on suicide. Because what it does is if I go on stage and be vulnerable and shed a tear or two, especially as a guy, then it gives other people permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences without any kind of recrimination. So I'm just there to, you know, to start the conversation. And, and again, because once you start it, it seems like everybody knows somebody or has had the experience themselves or loved one. So that's, 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 you know, how and why I got into. And then, then after my first TEDx, I got two emails 
from other TEDx events, hey, do you have another uh, mental health talk? So the next two I got asked to do. And then I, I um, applied for the fourth one and the fifth one. And then I applied, and then I got uh, somebody for the sixth one, which comes up in June. I'm going to record in June. They saw one of my other TED Talks and said, would you apply? Sure, I've got an idea. So I applied and I got it. So that'd be my sixth one. And I'm working on, in my head, I'm working on my seventh and eighth. Um, again, I think it's just part of my, part of my mental illness comes with that mental ableness. This is the way my mind works. And it's, TED Talks aren't really a lot of new information. It's all out there. It's how you find the connections and curate it in an original way. And that, that see, people with depression tend to, tend to see connections where other people don't, they miss them. Mm-hmm. You don't see quite the connection between this and that. Right. And I'll be driving down the road going, hmm, wonder why. Okay, there's a TEDx. Cause and effect, cause and effect, putting the pieces together. And I think I do yep. a lot of that, you know, as a consultant, I, I focus a lot on communication and veterinary teams, but also going into the practices and looking at systems and, you know, how things work and Sometimes it's really obvious to me when I walk in there and I can just kind of see how a, a, a quick little change in something will change everything about the ease of doing a task, but people have been in it for so long they can't see it anymore. Yeah, you know, it's fresh eyes. Mm-hmm. It is fresh eyes. It is fresh well, eyes. And as a comedian, by the way, that's uh, I, um, something of a superpower I'll say I'm going to be. I'm going to go do a conference uh, on um, the asphalt pavers of Iowa. And somebody said, "What do you know about asphalt paving?" Absolutely nothing. Well, I do know if you, uh, you know, an asphalt road's like a man. You lay them right the first time, you can drive all over for years. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I know nothing. So I go to the vendor showcase, the exhibit hall, and I wander. I got my old bag and I put tchotchkes in the bag and then and there's lots of comedy in that bag because it's all new to me all it makes sense to them mm-hmm. you know they don't they don't see anything funny about it till I pull it out and point it out and then they you know it's like it's like sculpting someone you said once you're sculpting an elephant whatever the medium is you just knock away everything that look like an elephant and there it is mm-hmm. same with jokes you just knock away everything that doesn't look like a joke so it's actually better for me not to know anything about because I have fresh eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, funny that you said that because um, years ago, when I had time, I used to paint, and people would say, "I don't understand how you can do that. How you can make things look realistically." And I said, "When you try to paint, you try to paint the whole picture." I said, "When I try to paint, I paint very small sets of of data. Basically, you're only looking at little pieces of it, and then when you put the pieces together, it's like a puzzle, and it all comes out." But people who try to paint, try to paint the whole person or the whole thing at the same time, rather than sort of dissecting it apart and, and painting small sections of it at a time. We're looking at the, the highlight, the light and the dark in, in one little, yeah. thing. you know, it's just one little thing. So I guess it's very similar to the art of crafting a joke is what strikes you. Yeah. You see the humor in things. You see the the quirkiness of, of something that other people would just pass over. Well, I tell, I tell people, I can, I can teach you to write stand up. I can teach you to perform. What I can't teach you to do is process the incoming. I'm on a Delta flight or I change planes in Atlanta. I get on the next flight. And it's, it's the day after the FAA had decided if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you can use it on takeoff or landing if it's in the airplane mode. So, you know, the flight attendants on Delta generally very Southern and she's, you know, she could do the usual, pre-flight safety thing in her sleep but she's got you know there's nothing written down about this so she's got an improv so i'm suspecting there may be comedy coming so i'm listening very for the first time in a long time listening carefully to the you know their spiel yeah and she talked about the floor pass lighting and the seat cushion the oxygen mask and then she gets to the uh you know the business with the ipad and iphone and she goes ladies and gentlemen due to new faa regulations Nothing's coming. Um, then she gets inspired. Due to new FAA regulation, if you have small equipment, you can continue playing with it. I'm bent over double laughing. Nobody else on the plane. My seatmate thinks I've lost my mind. What? I go, let's review. When 
before I can say anything else, she comes back on it. If you have large equipment, you have to shove that under the seat in front of you. So I'm down on my knees. Uh, but nobody else in the plane, everybody heard it. But they, nobody else registered it the way. They processed it and spit it back out. Obviously, you know, I just processed it the same way you did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I tell people who, who aren't mentally ill, I say, well, let me ask you this. I bet you've experienced this, kind of a small version of what I live with. You're in a theater, you're watching a movie, and there's a, you know, what you believe is a funny part, whatever on the screen. And you laugh, and then when you stop laughing, you realize you were the only one laughing. You're the only one that got it. That's my life. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is, you know, I'll, I'll tell you my funniest, I guess, event. It, it, it just sticks into my head. Anytime you shop in Walmart, it, it's an adventure. And I was shopping at Walmart for the animal hospital and I had a whole shopping cart full of box fans because we, you know, it was in the South. And in the summer, you wash all these dogs and you put a box fan on them and that's yeah. how you drive them. Well, there was this man walking down the aisle and two young girls come in opposite of us. And the man was kind of behind me. And it was like, you, you've seen those little old dried up Southern men that like almost bent double that really leathery looking like yeah. they were hosiery mill their whole life. So he's behind me. Well, these two girls come walking by and one of the girls has the worst posture I think I've ever seen in my life. And she's kind of slinking down the aisle like this and she's got on a bustier and she's these pants that are cranked down and she's thin but she's got them cranked so hard that the belt looks like it's going to squeeze her into like a toothpaste tube and and she's just basically kind of looks like a mess and so she walks past us and I look at this old guy and he looks at me and I look at him he looks at me and shakes his head and he goes ain't people got no mirrors in their house <laughs> I lost it so from then on anytime my husband and I see anybody who's dressed like we go, ain't she got no mirrors in there? Yeah. <laughs> but she just, you know, I don't know if anybody else would have thought it was funny, but it was funny. And the way he looked, just shaking his head, just looking at that girl, <laughs> the way she walked past him. Um, yeah, that's where comedy comes from. That's that's... Just go to Walmart and there's a uh, fodder for the mill. I'm there the other day. I'm walking from the automotive department to the grocery department. I got to walk through where all the clothes are. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what the hardest thing to find at Walmart is? A size small. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Again, I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to write, I'm not, it's just the, in, the input's coming yep. and it just processes that way. It's, it's, it's you know. So I, want, I do want to ask you this question because this, I it was thinking about this the other day. We're talking about cal cancel culture and political correctness. I was like, and is that really difficult for somebody in comedy to to buffer, I guess, what their jokes yeah. are? Or yeah. There are entertainers who won't work colleges anymore because it seems like everybody gets offended. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was working at the University of Montana Billings and I was there was a couple of kids taking me around to do it was open to the public. So we did some I did a commercial radio interview and we we're headed to the NPR station. And he said to me, are you worried about people getting offended? You know, because sometimes the comics come to campus, people get upset. And I said, well, if I was a comedian, I would be very careful. And I worked the cruise ships for 10 years. I mean, you know, you got people from eight to 80. You've got to be very careful. Right. Um, I said, I would, you know, I'd worry about it on the college campuses. But I'm here, I'm here talking about suicide prevention. So, you know, if they get offended, <laughs> then I drop the F bomb. Um, Oh, and get this, shortly thereafter, we go to the NPR station. It's a young woman. She's probably 28, 29 years old. And I know what she meant when she said this, because I've worked in the radio. She meant that she didn't have the studio quite ready. So she said, could you give me 10 minutes? And before I could stop myself, I said, I'm 62 years old. I can give you a good solid five. <laughs> and I said to the kid with me, did I just say that out loud? Fortunately, she had a good sense of humor because uh -huh. that could have gotten me in. Oh, could, who knows yeah, could, I could see it. I could see. Yeah. It. No, I just you know that's the, that's the good that's the you know this. I, I'm bet you doing comedy. You're a comedian. Uh -huh. um, you know, people get offended because you you know. But as a speaker, you're getting paid to be to you know to tell hard truths and to give your opinion, and uh -huh. it's it's a whole different paradigm. Uh -huh. um, 
and so I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm there to save lives. I don't care if I stepped on your toes. I'm right. sorry. Yes. But you know, it's, it's a matter of life or death. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of people out there, I think, who would like to be, become speakers or, you know, hone those skills. How did you, I mean, I know, you know, obviously seven years of stand-up, well, you could handle any heckler out there in the world. Yeah. How do you, it's a different audience. It's a, it's a different expectation when you're doing keynote, people are expecting you to teach them something more so than make them laugh. So how do you, how'd you change horses? Well, the, the good news about a keynote where you're not booked as the comic the bar is very much lower on comedy. So when you deliver on the comedy and it's good, you know, they, they're they thrilled. Because, you know, a, a keynote could be deadly. Yeah, I guess. And the only difficulty I had was, as a comedian, you're trying to get a laugh every seven to nine seconds. And with a keynote, there's a lot of silence. They're, they're obviously paying attention and interested in what you have to say, but they're there's they're not demonstrative because that's not so it took me a while to get used to the the silence. Mm-hmm. Uh that you know, lack lack of the laughter or applause or whatever during it, you know, from a joke. Uh, but once I got used to teaching them something, you know, realize realizing I'm teaching them how to save someone else's life, then you know, the jokes, the the laughs now are just a bonus. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's still as, I mean, again, things go wrong and you can just, you know, you can like, like a good heckler line, you can deliver, right. you know, right. and people wonder how in the heck did you think that, you know, some will drop, some out poor waiter will drop a tray of glasses right in the middle of the keynote and I'll turn and go, yeah, yeah, just set that down anywhere. <laughs> or somebody comes in late. This happened on Friday at a community college. This young woman came in late to the three hour CE. So as I ventured to eat, and I said, hey, can we get you anything? Like a watch? Comedy club line. I said, no, I'm just kidding. Just calm. I'm just, bless your heart. We're happy to have you. You know, it, it, be careful. I don't, right. offend, I don't want to offend anybody that way. Right. I said, no, it's an old comedy club line. I was just picking on it. Well, I, I had to teach a class one day, and um, of course, I this, this distribution company had arranged the class. They were supposed to have binders for everybody there. So I get there and I go, do you guys have books? And they went, we don't know. So everybody's looking around, looking for the UPS delivery. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I'm calling the uh, the person in charge going, we have no binders here. We have no materials to work with. So I can wing it for a little while, but you guys can figure something out. And come to find out the guy who was in charge of it, it was his, like his first time doing it. They didn't tell him he was supposed to order the books. He said, damn, I thought you were supposed to. I went, nah, I just show up and talk. And so when the, I look at the audience as well, you know what, they're going to go make us some binders. And I went, this is what happens when you let a man be in charge. <laughs> <It's> like, oh, <laughs> <Ta-da>. <laughs> actually done. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just have to kind of be able to put a little bit and, and gather that audience together on the journey that you're going to. And hopefully they come along with you and, and enjoy it. And I think, good speakers uh, you know I, I laugh as people have come up and said you know we really enjoyed your class and went, I'm so glad of that because I have sat through misery so many times listening to people who droned on and read powerpoint slides out loud to me somebody said to me one day can I have your slide deck and I went there's nothing on them if you will notice there's like a picture of a choo-choo train there's like a rabbit <laughs> there's, there's no words <laughs> on my slide deck so yeah you, you can have it. it. There's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I'm glad you listened because that's what I want you to do is listen, not madly take notes of whatever is on the screen up here. So, Frank, I do want to talk to a little bit about you. You talked about, um, and, and I asked you this question. I remember it really well. So if you suspect that somebody is struggling mentally, what do you do? We want you know, we want some steps here. What do we go to people and say? Here's oh, me. okay. Um, I know you have the answer because you told me. Before. Oh, I've, <laughs> that's a, well, a question comes up all the time. My friends suppress what I say. Well, first of all, don't say anything. Just actively listen non-judgmentally and make sure you don't have another appointment backed up against it so you're looking at your watch. Now, what I normally start in my 
keynote with is how do you spot the signs and symptoms of depression, thoughts, or suicide? Because if, if eight out of 10 people who are suicidal or ambivalent, nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to it, that means all these people, vast majority, want somebody to notice something and say something. So the question arises, well, how do you know they're depressed? If they don't tell you, how do you know? Well, uh, eat too much, can't eat, sleep too much, can't sleep. Um, has trouble getting to work in the morning, let's say, but rallies in the afternoon. And here's one you can observe firsthand, let their personal hygiene go. I tell people that when I do a veterinarian um, convention, I go, look, if you got a client that comes in and you know, they've always been pretty well put together every time you see them. Same with dentists, you know, they, you know, they, they actually take care of themselves and all of a sudden they show up one day and their hair is a little dirty and the clothes aren't quite so clean. Mm -hmm. It may be because they're having trouble getting out of bed in the morning to run a load of wash, take a shower. Mm -hmm. So you, you look to see, and what you're looking for is patterns, not just a one-off. Well, yeah, he's probably working in the garden today. That's, that's fine. But it's, you know, it's just, you know, you notice he's not getting, you know, he says not getting a good night's sleep, um, you know, can't eat, has not got no appetite. And all of a sudden they look like they're not taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. their hygiene. Um, the question comes up, then what do you say to somebody like that? So, well, here's what you don't say. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Turn that frown upside down. Have you tried fish oil? My favorite is you should choose joy. Well, if you're not talking about dishwashing, like, well, we're out of luck. Because if I could have done that, I'd have done that 40 years ago. If I could do it. You mean yoga um, and meditation isn't going to be the cure for everything? No, although it can, it can it be a, an integral part of a self-care plan. I meditate twice a day, a guided meditation. Um, what you do say is, look, I know you're not crazy or lazy or self-absorbed. I know that depression is a mental illness. Here's the good news. With time and treatment, you will get better. And I'll take the time and I'll help you get that treatment. And then you have to ask them, this is really hard. He and Warren for me. Are you having thoughts of suicide? And if you can't ask that question just like that, find somebody who can because you need to pin them down. Now, let's say they aren't forthcoming, you still suspect that they may be suicidal. How would you know? What kind of behavior are you looking for? Well, they uh, frequently talk about death and dying, or you catch them Googling death and dying, or death and dying appears as a theme in their artwork, their music, their writing, uh, getting their affairs in order, especially giving away prized possessions. I did a dental conference a couple of years ago, and I ran into to one of the dentists at a dental conference in April. And he said, Frank, I got to tell you, you know, at that conference, you told us one of the signs of thoughts of suicide was giving away prized possessions as part of getting your affairs in order. Because you want to make sure they go to the people you want them to go to when you're gone. So he said, fast forward to last month. My wife and I, the kids are out of the house. I mean, they're all married off, got their own lives. We're downsizing from like four bedroom, two story to a, you know, a three bedroom ranch, small house. And I got all this stuff in the garage and there's no way there's enough room for all of this at the new place. So I began, I go on Facebook and I'm giving stuff away. And I get a phone call from the other dentist who's at that same function two years ago. Whether you're, Dude, you okay? Why would you think I'm not okay? Well, you know, Frank said, giving away your prized possessions, and I know you love those golf clubs. No, we're, <laughs> thank you for asking. We're downsizing. And by the way, would you like the clubs? Yeah. So yeah. getting your affairs in order is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, accumulating the means to die by suicide. You know, whether it's stockpiling medication or buying a firearm. The thing about veterinarians is 74% of veterinarians who die by suicide die by barbiturate. Because they have easy access. Easy access. Yep. Yep. Only only 24, 25% of the general population dies by barbiturate with veterinarians. And more female veterinarians die than male veterinarians. Mm -hmm. um, not quite sure why there's some suspicion as to why that happened. Well, we also 80% of our profession is now female. So the statistics are just oh Lord. Yes. Oh, okay. That I did not know. Yeah. Uh finally, this this is not this is not an exhaustive list. This is just like top five or six things. Um I think is really dangerous. They've been depressed forever. And then all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, they're happy. And you're happy because thank the Lord, they're finally happy. Well, they may be happy because they've chosen time, place, and method. Mm -hmm. And they know the pain is coming to an end. And for most people who are suicidal, it's not about killing yourself. It's about simply ending that pain.
And so, you, you know, and again, what you're looking for is patterns. You know, are they having trouble getting to work in the morning, appetite, sleep? You know, are they, have you caught them giving away prized possessions or it seems like they're getting their affairs in order to saying goodbye to everybody? Um, now, veterinarians, the, was it Bartonella? Is that the name of the illness that animals get? It, it is one, yeah. When I was at the AVMA, I met somebody who was talking about diseases that animals have that actually cross species. Yes. Yes. And they think, for example, with Bartonella, I think if you, you know, if you get a cat bite or cat saliva in a bite, that you can that humans can get Bartonella. And one of the symptoms of Bartonella in humans is depression. Wow. So maybe that's why I always suggest people, if they're depressed or have an issue. Have a physical first. Make sure there's no organic physical reason why you're feeling this way. We're just presenting as depression. And tell, telling your human doctor that you work at animal health is something they really do need to know and pay attention to. And I can tell yeah. you just from my own experience in sending team members to doctors, a lot of times animal health um, zoonotic diseases, the cross species diseases are not on their radar. No, because they're, they're not thinking about that. And you say, look, I work in animal health. This is a cat bite or this is the thing that happened to me or I was exposed to ticks. Then, OK, well, maybe it changes that diagnosis in that process. So, yeah, I think that's that's really interesting to know that just some of the things that it's not a common thing, depending on where you are, but it's not really. No. Thing, but still it would be i mean i don't know anybody who had been bitten or scratched or worse than animal health yes and let's say you get uh, you work around you know their ticks mm -hmm. i mean what they they may they might miss the lyme disease diagnosis because they why would they assume that you were around a lot of ticks right anyway. well we we actually diagnosed a dog with lyme disease the owner had been going to the doctor for two years run all kinds of tests and everything and she said Oh my God. She went back to the doctor and said, my dog is positive for Lyme. They ran a Lyme test on her and that's what was wrong with her. So because we were in North Carolina, you know, and their, their thoughts were, oh, that's up North. That's in Pennsylvania. Yeah. North. We don't have that here. But yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Well, and, and my favorite aunt, who's now, now passed away in her mid eighties, um, she had a disease called derm dermatomycitis. It's what, what happens is uh, it happens most often to women. They've had cancer of some kind and didn't know it. Their body fought off the cancer. And the problem was it didn't shut off once it fought off. So it begins to have a negative effect. She could, she could hardly get out of bed in the morning. And muscular, uh, kind of wasting away. And her, her doctor, male, you know, it's, you know, it's depression. It's, you know, it's, uh, well, she goes to see her veterinarian. And she's handing him the money and he grabs her hand and he looks at her fingernails and they're bright red underneath the fingernails. And he said, you need to go to Vanderbilt. She lives in that, lived in Nashville. You need to go to Vanderbilt, see a rheumatologist. I think you have dermatomycitis, just judging from your fingernails. And sure enough, he yeah. saved her life I'm because well, she, got a, she got on methotrexate, which is horrible, but it gave her an extra 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've so, always, always told my clients that the veterinarians are some of the best doctors walking the earth because our, our patients don't tell us what's wrong with us. You know, that's right. Have, we have to figure it out. And they just think um, uh, outside of the box because animals do crazy stuff. And we always are like, what? How did you even, how did you even do this thing? <laughs> uh, and and uh, the tales that, you know, we've been told over the years, uh, one of my favorite speaker questions is tell me about the craziest thing that ever in a client happened you know in your in your hospital and some of the stories are a hoot yeah my workout partner is a retired veterinarian uh, um he's a hey, forced into retirement he's got parkinson's um but it's it's um idiopathic we have no idea why he has it when the family has it it may have an exposure to chemicals early on in the practice perhaps uh fortunately slow moving it's you know it's not progressing rapidly but he worked in Tennessee, uh, at the zoo in Tennessee, actually, for a while. And then he worked in private practice. And he said that he had a guy call him up one day 
and said, I want my dog, I want my dog decapitated. And he says, well, we, we can, we can do that. Um, just out of curiosity, why do you want your dog decapitated? And the guy says, cause I don't want him to sire any puppies. <laughs> and my friend goes, well, you know, that would do it. That'd do it. <laughs> I think you mean castrated, I think. <laughs> and they had a code um, for guys like that in the file. It was B as in boy, E as in Edward, M as in moron. And what BEM stood for was booger eating moron. <laughs> and it, if, if somebody came in with, a, there was a woman who brought puppies in and she had been trying to breastfeed them herself. Not the first Again, time I've heard it. BEM, yep. booger eating moron. Yep. Uh, I said, most amazing things, people. Um, you just, you just, one, one girl told me that somebody brought in a, a parasite, a parasitic worm into the practice in a piece of cellophane like that comes off of a cigarette pack and said, can you tell me what kind of worm this is? Handed it to the receptionist and she said, it came out of my boyfriend's butt this morning when we we're laying in the bed. And <laughs> so there's different levels of gross that, that animal hospital, I mean, we deal with our own gross, but we don't want to deal with people gross. You just keep people gross to yourself. And our pat line is we are not human doctors and you just need to go and ask your doctor that question because we don't do that stuff here. But no, oh, oh. I've got a friend who took her uh, puppy in to be neutered and handed to the vet tech. And she goes, yeah, is it neutered or castrated i can't remember and so when she went back to get the puppy who survived the operation neutering the vet came out and handed her the puppy and my friend said to him listen i just have one piece of advice for you if you decide to have a vasectomy don't let her schedule it <laughs> <laughs> oh my god there, I mean, we could tell honestly oh, yeah. so many stories oh. is unbelievable but but our our time is is drawing near frank so any final words of wisdom to people out there about you know basically resilience following the path um bravery whatever you well, want to say. i you know i i feel fortunate in that people go, how could you feel fortunate to be depressed and suicidal well it's you know it's it's a blessing and a curse um i'm probably the most positive suicidal person you'll ever meet uh, and I'm, I'm used to the thoughts of suicide, used to the depression. I don't know how long the cycle lasts. You know, I just, I just sort of, I live with it. Don't fight it. Just live with it. Um, and for, for veterinarians, we are a pet centered family. We have three rescue German shepherds and 11 rescue cats. That's a lot of hair, Frank. I uh, know. And all have better health insurance than I do, by the way, which makes it, I bet there's a piece of advice. If you have an animal, get them, get the pet health insurance. Yeah, preach to because it makes it makes those decisions at the veterinarian's office so much easier for you, for the staff, for the veterinarian. Yeah. You know, and somebody said to me, "What you're really doing is you're amortizing the cost of an animal over their lifetime. Mm -hmm. You're paying a monthly fee, and it, it, it just basically you, you're paying all these things in advance yeah. by paying well, a monthly fee. So like the, the same plan, you know, same deal." Yeah. So when the vet says, you know, it needs a new hip for $5,000 or whatever it is, you know, it's no, there's no question mm -hmm. um, you're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, the, the upside of being suicidal, we had wildfires last September and it came within a mile and a quarter of our house. Mm -hmm. I was downtown when it, it went from level one, which is get ready. It's supposed to go to get set, meaning pack everything and, mm -hmm. and then three is go and don't look back, don't stop. Don't. Well, it went from one to three. And they evacuated my neighborhood because the, the fire is a mile and a quarter away. Well, I have 11 rescue cats in that house. There's no way I'm not going to at least attempt to get them so they don't die in the fire. Yeah. So being suicidal, what have I got to lose? I drive back in, you know, load the cats and it's getting darker, smoke billowing. And, I, I'm, and I'm not even, I'm not sure we're going to make it out. So I made a little video because I didn't know if we're going to get out alive. Um, telling my wife goodbye and my sister and my, you know, my, my best friends and whatever, and, and crying and uh, for about two and a half minutes. Unfortunately, we all made it out. Um, but with that many animals, um, I got to say, when we move and let the veterinarian know we're moving, they are devastated. 
Oh, I bet. Yeah. With yeah. eleven animals <laughs> and all of them have health insurance. Yeah. All you can't, you <laughs> can't leave. We just bought the new X-ray machine. We were counting on. <laughs> That's right. Pediatric wellness plans for all these kids as they get yeah. old. No, it's it's they're my fur little antidepressants. They're part of my self care plan. Um, I would say if you're looking for advice, if you are suffering maybe situational depression because of the pandemic, you've never been depressed, but all of a sudden you are. That's not unusual in a in a difficult situation. It's a rational reaction to an irrational situation. Uh, my advice: get get a physical first, and then have a mental health evaluation. And if medications indicated, because a lot of people who are neuronormal. Who find themselves at that juncture think if they start taking depressants, it's a life sentence. Mm -hmm. But no, you'll just take them until things ease up and you taper off and you may never use them ever again. It's just a way of taking the edge off and keeping you moving forward during I mean, the times are so uncertain. You know, I mean, they're good mentally ill people. I have no problem with this. I mean, you know, I, was, I was built for this because I, I wake up in an uncertain world every day. So I've got systems in place. I said somebody's like starring in the walking dead for 10 years <laughs> and then there's a zombie apocalypse and you're like look i got this we build a fort we plant some vegetables make sure you stick them in the head that's all i'm saying that's it. yeah so that's you know that my advice take care of yourself you need a self-care plan yeah I, I agree with that i agree with that you know what go outside every now and then get away from the yeah screen. do something yeah. nice to somebody else get out of your own head yeah go do something i you know i always think um, a couple of years ago at one of the conferences, Michael J. Fox was the keynote speaker. Yeah. As he approached the podium, he stumbled up the stairs, those metal stairs, they go up on those steps. And then he got to the podium and he stood there and his hands were bleeding as he stood to give the keynote. And the thing that struck me as he spoke about the foundation and all that he was doing was, look, don't feel sorry for yourself. If you want to feel better about life, go do something for somebody else. And I thought, amen, amen, brother. That is exactly it. And that's what you talked about too, is, you know, through that networking and, and the, the Dixie channeling through you. Yeah. I have a keynote. My networking keynote is called WWDD. What would Dixie what do? What would Dixie do? That's, that's a, yeah. That's that's the mama like we all want to have is somebody that yeah, a southern a strong southern woman. Yep, that's it. That's that's who raised me. So it worked yeah. out on that on my end. Yeah. And too. All right. There's a great book called All Over About the Shouting by a gentleman who was a new a Pulitzer Prize. He won a Pulitzer for it. At or, he won a Pulitzer Prize. He worked for the New York Times as a reporter and he wrote all all over about the shouting and he read the book. He did the audible. Oh, what's the, his name? Do you remember? Um. I know the title is all over about the shouting. We can look it up. We can find Maybe, it. Yeah. Oh, I'm telling you. And be careful when you read it. Um, I was in a rental car and it was on a CD. And I'm going down the road and he reads it. And I mean, <laughs> I'm bawling. Uh oh. People are driving by me go, don't look, don't look. He's probably coming from a funeral. Um, when he talks about how his mother lived on the Georgia, Alabama border, dirt poor, you know, father came and went. And he, he delivered this line. My mother let me climb up her spine out of poverty. And I am just, you know, just having been raised by a southern, strong southern woman. Yeah. I'm just bawling. Oh my God. Wow. That's great story though. It's it's David something, I think. Okay. Uh, anyway. Well, I'll find it. We're gonna put it in the notes at the end of the podcast because we'll oh get up and let me give you my phone number because i always do this when i yeah. keynote and i always do when i podcast it's yep. uh area code 858 405 i tell people look if you're suicidal call the hotline if you're just having a bad day call a crazy person and there's my phone number and people call because I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to tell you what you should be doing. I'm just going to co-sign whatever BS you're waiting through. There you go. There you go. I, I hear the same music. You don't explain anything. And people call, not often, but they do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? It doesn't take but one. I wrote um, something. I was thinking about my father a year or so ago, Father's Day. And I wrote something in LinkedIn, and it was called Please Stay. And I talked about growing up without a father the importance of him not 
being there when I went to prom or walking me down the aisle and all the other things that I had accomplished in my life and being able to know that I'm, you know, an international speaker and those kind of things. And so I said, if you're thinking about that, your, your family's better off without you, they're not, they won't ever be, and they need you and they love you and they, they want you. And somebody messaged me on LinkedIn and said, you just don't know how much I needed to hear that. So sometimes, yeah, you know, God inspires you to write things and you put them out there in the universe and they just, they're there for whoever needs to read them. And that's what they're well, for. And that, that's called burdensomeness in the mental health business. People say, you know, suicide is a selfish act. Well, wasn't he thinking about his family? Well, you know what? Chances are he was because he feels or she feels the world and their family would be better off without them. Without them. So uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's irrational, but it's selfless in that way. Mm -hmm. I had a million dollar life insurance policy and that's why I was going to kill myself because we filed bankruptcy and I could restore my wife financially. Mm -hmm. And I hope if you'd ask her, okay, here, here's the choice. You can have the million bucks or you can have Frank and nothing. Hopefully she would say, <laughs> Sure I'll take him with no money. Uh, what's behind door number three? Uh, so, but that's 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 called burdensomeness. Yeah. It's one of the three legged three legs of the three legged stool of suicidality. Is that feeling of you know the world would be better off, but right. truly it, it won't be, it won't. and you you're going to leave a lot of collateral damage in your wake. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so call me if you're call the hotline if you're that suicidal. That's right. Just having a bad day, you know. Just call and talk to Frank. He will tell you a joke or two. <laughs> That's right. If you're a veterinarian and your best client with 11 animals is leaving town and you just bought a new piece of equipment, you have no idea how you're going to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Frank. Oh, man. Frank, this has been great. And I knew it would be. So thank you very much for teaching us and entertaining us simultaneously and generously offering that phone number to anybody who's struggling because certainly, you know, you have the knowledge to help them. And, uh, you know, they can always call me too. Uh, if, if, if I'm not trained like you are, but I'm, I'm happy to help talk to somebody. Well, listen. And uh, on a, on a uh, positive note, I, I sp I've spoken to the Washington State Veterinary Medical Association twice. And the last time I did, I guess I got a call from a vet tech. And she's head of the vet techs association, I guess, mm -hmm. state of Washington. And they did remember the talk. And they, uh, on the 17th, 17th, no, on the 14th. I'll be doing two sessions, one on, um, you know, surviving the pandemic and staying sane, and the other one on suicide prevention for those guys, you know, by, by Zoom. Uh, so, we are yeah, all you know, it's, it's, you know, you forget the impact you have on people that, you know, you do your thing, you leave and you wonder. Yeah, 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 you hope it, you hope it worked and, and you're there in the right, whatever, you know, the right moment at the right time. So we can all yep. just put out everything we can to help and hope that it works. That's it. Well, All right. the good work. Yeah. Yep. So thank you, Frank. I appreciate you. And we'll have your information available at the end of the podcast. And mm -hmm. I appreciate you um, sharing your story on the bed. And I got to go clean six cat boxes. <sighs> hey, we could clean 40 in our world. So. Oh, my God. Perspective is everything, Frank. Uh, you are correct. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. See you guys.